Welcome to Lawmen, the podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm Alistair Beckett King. And I'm Alistair's Batman and Robin, James Shakeshaft. In each episode, we'll unearth pieces of forgotten folklore and hold them up to the searing light of our arbitrary scoring system. So have you got a story this time? I have got a story, yes. Um, I've got a story about Minster Lovell. Minster Lovell. Minster Lovell. A person or a place? Oh, no, it's a place. It's a place. But it does sound like a person. Minster. Is that a title or is that a first name? I don't know. Just a typo in Mr. 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 Lovell. Mr. Lovell. The Spaceman. Right? Jim Lovell? I don't Captain know. I don't know. You don't know enough about Spacemen. Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I need to know all the names of the Spacemen. <laughs> no, this is Minster Level, which is a place. It's a, a building. It's now a ruin, and it's near enough to my house that when we all learned to drive, we would go there at night because it was spooky. And we, in fact, this particular uh, piece of folklore, we I, I have a, a very strong memory of sitting in the ruins at night with my friends and reading this by... Um, Lantern light. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Lantern? I think we got a torch out, but we had taken like a little shepherdy crook hurricane lamp thing. Did you Did you grow up in the 16th century? <laughs> no, we just wished we did. Um, <laughs> I bet you, you were some of the coolest kids around at I, the time. I think the bagginess of my brown cords showed <laughs> the level of my coolness. And, and while we read the story, we heard what sounded like footsteps coming towards us across the gravel in the ruin, and we looked and there was no one there. Mm. Mm. It might have been something dripping. It might have just been some dripping, echoing. Ghost we were dripping. Scared. Dripping ectoplasm, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ghost dripping. A moist, a moist ghost approaching. Ghost dripping on it's ghost like on, toast. On ghost toast. <laughs> <laughs> Desiree would not like that. Although well, that put her in a quite the quandary, wouldn't it? Desiree uh, sang life, right? I don't know. <sighs> You don't Look, know Space I don't know, I don't know the, don't the R&B know slash soul. I don't even know what genre of music she exists in. <laughs> She's got what's considered to be the worst lyrics in the world in the song Life. She goes, I wouldn't like to meet a ghost. That's the thing I fear the most. I'd rather eat a piece of toast. <laughs> <laughs> are those, those are actual lyrics that in the is, song? I'm, if I've got it wrong, I've made it better. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she rhymes ghost toast most. If she was presented with a plate of ghost dripping on toast, she'd be she, understandably furious. She wouldn't know what to do. She's she wouldn't know where to look. Position clear <laughs> yeah. on toast and ghosts. She would leave that restaurant. So, Minster Lovell, yes. Now, this annoyingly, there seems to be one thing that happened, and then there's two stories about it which are mutually exclusive. Like if one thing's true. <laughs> Big pause before true there. (laughs) It's annoying. They've got two different legends about the same thing, but they're, it's clear, it kind of makes you think it was all. But it's, so I don't know what order to say them because they both spoil the punchline for each other. The the, the way that these sort of tales, they have like a little reveal at the end. This kind of has the same reveal, but two different setups. Whenever that's happened with a story I've done, I've just told them both simultaneously with all the contradictions. (laughs) So the first version refers to. Francis Lovell. He's from the medieval time. Medieval. I would say medieval. I would, because that's, that's how it's written. <laughs> For someone who just a minute ago said medieval, you're very angry. <laughs> and said Minster Lovell might be a typo, <laughs> and it's referring to a spaceman. <laughs> or oh, astronaut. Uh, this guy features in a rhyme, which is good always value, a good yeah. thing. The rhyme is from the time of Richard III. He was a companion, close friend and minister of Richard III, this Francis Lovell guy. And his name occurs in a famous bit of doggerel, which goes, The cat, the rat, and Lovell the dog, ride all England under the hog. I said England there, which annoyed me. (laughs) Sorry, does it not say England? No, it says you just said England. That. You added that. I've really d- done myself over being so... <laughs> so, uh, so is, is the hog Richard III? I guess Richard III is the hog. Love all the dog is because he had a, ho- a hound on his coat of arms. I don't know who the cat and the rat are. No one does. Uh, after Richard III's death uh, in the car park Spoiler in Leicester... Spoiler for the play Richard III. Oh, and the history book. Yep. He tried to bring a revolt, which failed, and he kind of went missing from history. In fact, a later king... 
<laughs> he went missing from history. He went missing from the book history. <laughs> he was he was definitely defeated at Stamford Bridge, and the thing is, they never found his body. He may have got away though, or he was trying to cross a river, but the side was too steep, and he drowned. It. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now intentionally getting things a real wrong. surplus of syllables. To cover up for any <laughs> any mistakes that I make in life. Or this thing that we're going to talk about happened okay. to him. Good. One of the reports uh, claimed that he didn't die in the battle, but he lived long afterwards in a cave or vault. It was during Henry VIII that they tried to they set up a jury to try and establish the fact of his death, and they still. So that's like two kings later, isn't it? Yeah, they, That's they, quite a long time. Yeah, it, they reckoned he'd escaped abroad. But there was a macabre discovery, because I don't know how to say macabre. <laughs> I'm really happy that I did all that stuff already. That is some well-laid groundwork. Yeah, um, it was from the early 18th century. And according to the clerk of the House of Commons in 1728, again, I don't know whether it's going to be clerk or clerk, so I've covered my back again, the Earl of Rutland had some workmen doing repair at Minster Level Hall and they found a secret room. And in that secret room was a table and a chair and in that chair was the skeleton (laughs) of a man with a skeleton of a dog at his feet. And as as the air touched these bodies, they turned into dust. That happens conveniently in lots of stories. Yeah, it does, doesn't Mm. it? And so it's believed that this was Francis Lovell. He'd nice. hold up in his... He had a secret room made in Mr. Lovell Hall. He'd hold up in there. He only had one servant who knew of his location. That servant died. Francis he then just, died, he was starved there. and died mm. in the little room. A prisoner in his own home. And it's meant to be his ghost that walks around uh, the ruins to this day. That's story A. Story A. I just remembered, this is an aside... There was also a person walled up in Hermitage Castle from the last story, and I, there was so much going on that one, I forgot to mention it. Oh, no. Yeah. So it's just someone walled up. Was that... Uh, and I think he didn't even turn to dust when they found him, uh, so I think he genuinely was definitely there. Was he walled up on purpose, though? Because that was that as punishment, wicked yes. man. Sorry, that was just an aside. So, so that was story A. What is story B? Now, story B is a version of the mistletoe bride. In this case, it, for some reason, it's called the mistletoe bow. This is a tale that crops up all over the country. So this is set at Lovell Hall, and the young Mister Lovell. I don't. It, it doesn't matter which one because this is this one's definitely not true. Um, <laughs> on his wedding day, they're having the big party. That in the evening they decide to have a game of hide and seek. The bride hides. She cannot be found. Days, weeks, people are getting worried he thinks that she's eloped with someone maybe you know he's he's going through all sorts you know he dies a broken man many years later and then after this point they find they open this big old chest in the loft inside a skeleton in bridal gear bridal not a horse <laughs> <laughs> it is horseplay uh, but no this yeah a bride in a in a wedding dress mm. is found dead it's his ghost that haunts the grounds, looking, sobbing and looking for the And presumably bride. shouting, how did you not think to look in the person-sized chest in the loft? Yes. That's exactly the kind of place you would hide. That's ex- yeah, that is, it's hide and seek. Do some more seeking. No, well, she's not standing in the centre of any of these rooms. Yeah. Let's call it a day. Yeah, let she probably eloped. And so, yeah, that's story B. And that sort of undermines anything because it just sort of says well they might have found a skeleton but like you can't it's not it's not even the same skeleton it's just someone had an idea that they might have found a skeleton at Minster Lovell we know one of them was found in skeletal form Mm. I could do a try and do the mashup of A and B so a servant or builder found a man and dog or bride (laughs) in a walled up room or chest (laughs) and the ghost of the person who was looking for that bride slash man with dog haunts the grounds to this day. In a state of some confusion. Justifiably upset. <laughs> so, yes, 
that be they. To the scores. To the scores. Once sir. more to the scores. Uh, this is a classic. It's naming. The category of naming. Well, what, what you've done is you've sneakily mispronounced a whole load of words <laughs> to, to add uh, unearned interest to, to the names and the words in, in the story. Yeah. So we've got we've got both Minster Lovell and Mr. Lovell, who later on revealed. <laughs> yeah. Neither of them astronauts. One of them a place, the other one just a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lovell's a perfectly nice name, and it, and he does share it with an astronaut. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got Desiree; she's got an apostrophe in her name. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Do any? Do we have any other names? No, um, I even just wrote. I I didn't even bother. It was William Lovell was that guy's name, the eldest son of the family. Well, that's that is. Uh, you're losing points for that because that's a very very boring. The person. bride doesn't even have a name. You're right not to give me many points. So I. I'm going to say many points. So, yeah. so you're ruling out the possibility of it being a one-pointer. All right. Um, b- because of the connection to Spaceman Astronaut Jim Lovell, I'm going to say two two points. One for space and one for the names in the story. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm very... you're, you're more than welcome. I'm being generous. Yeah, you are. Yeah. And another classic, Supernatural. The supernatural category. Supernatural. Well, I don't really think you've got much supernatural. So you've got, you've got, uh, you've got whichever one of them actually did die at haunts the place. Yes. And you met a moist ghost. I heard a moist you, ghost. You heard a moist ghost. <laughs> but it was the ghost. This is a. St- this is real. This is the. It's not real. <laughs> but <laughs> we we were telling this story. The story of the place in the in place. the place, and we thought we heard. The, the ghost in the story. Multiple people. It wasn't just one person going, nor did you hear that, and everyone else going, oh, stop messing about. Well, I suppose if uh, if, a, if a bunch of sort of rough and ready troublemakers like you and your friends mm. could be scared by this ghost, yeah. it's got to be pretty bone-shiveringly frightening. Mm-hmm. So that, well, that, that in itself has got to be an, a, an extra point added to whatever the base score is. But I must say, I think the base score is quite low Aww. for Supernatural. We've simply got the fact that the people who died came back and were a bit haunty. Well... It's not you giving it multiple there. I'm gonna have to, it's it is, I'm gonna do myself out of points. It's one ghost and two two two, two uh, hypotheses mm, for up to but not exceeding one ghost. There is there has been the the spectre of a tall man in a cloak. You're just dropping in new ghosts grown, during the scoring. Well, this is more. I think this is the one ghost. I've already closed the inbox for ghosts. Groaning sounds coming from the ground. <laughs> Saying it won't have any impact on the score. I've li- I've read read that word for word in the book Folklore and Mysteries of the Cotswolds. Groaning sounds heard from the coming from the ground. Ooh. Three points. Yes. You got three points, but only because of those groaning sounds coming from the ground. Where are they coming from? The ground. <laughs> if you so if we dig a little hole, are they louder? Yeah. Is that how this works? If you dig a hole you'd just be able to see just a ghost's head. That's quite frightening. What's the next category? Parlour games gone wrong. What you, Yes. Very poor quality seeking. Very, very poor quality seeking. I mean, I they've done so bad at hide and seek. I wouldn't want to entrust them with giant Jenga. They've or... done so bad at seek. They did. She did. <laughs> she won. She won that game. Uh, in the in the case of the other version, where the a guy and his dog were walled up and no one found them. How could he? If the other guy could bring in, how could he not get out? Mm. Was there just one brick for putting in food? I mean, he. He'd leave a note. He'd shout. Like he was the only guy with the key. And well, the you'd only keep guy a key in there. the room, wouldn't you? Keep a copy in the room in case you needed to leave. It's like a panic room. But mm. The panic begins once you're in the room. <laughs> and you realise you've designed it terribly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but adds no value to parlour games. Gone. I mean, these guys. I wouldn't want to see them playing charades. Somebody would be losing fingers at least in yeah. any other parlour game based on based on a hide and seek death. In a, in a game of charades, sh- this bride would like go to drama school for three years and then be <laughs> out of work for a number of times trying to get bit parts in other people's games of charades <laughs> before finally doing a career defining charades. All right, it's I think it's I think it's a four, and the reason it's not five is that being in a room on your own is not a parlour game. Yeah, that's Even true. if there's a dog there. It's <laughs> yeah. not a parlour. Very serious as well. It's not a game. Dead Man's Hide. Is that... Are you trying to come up with a name? I'm trying to game? come up with a name of Where a Where you just game. hide in a room and die. Yeah, until you die. <laughs> <laughs> he wins. He won that game. But it's like sardines, but with one sardine, but it is still dead. And a dog. 
Well, the dog will eat the sardine. Well, that brings me to the final category, dust. Dust. Oh, did we get a score? It was four, wasn't it? Was, it? it was four. Yeah. yeah, it was a solid four. Dust. Explain this category. <laughs> I noticed that there was a lot of dust in this story, (laughs) and I thought this would be an easy way to get five, because you can't argue that there isn't dust. So you were gerrymandering the whole system, because you knew that you were going to score poorly on naming and Supernatural, because of your your weak... I didn't think I would score as as weakly on Supernatural. I thought my word counted for more. (laughs) (laughs) But I did want to make sure that I had a high school because you can't argue that there's dust. You can argue about where the dust came from, whether or not a body will disintegrate that quickly. Mm. Uh, uh, it, it, it would uh, need to be very dry. A tiny breeze. I mean, uh, but presumably the loft, the attic with the chest, mm. the surrounding area would also be quite dusty. It must be dust. <laughs> that's that's the sl- marketing slogan for dust. <laughs> it must be dust. <laughs> When you're trying to decide yeah. what to coat your surfaces with, <laughs> it must be dust. It must be dust. Five yes. points. Yes. Whether or not... I mean, I don't know if you could tell from a dust whether it's a human or a dog's... <laughs> from a dust. Um, Skellington. I don't even say it like that. It annoys <laughs> me when people say it like that. The, the, I, it did bring up a point that I wanted to make that I think punctures a big hole in the disgraced Viscount Francis Lovell's story. So these these builders in the 18th century find the secret room with a, with the skeleton of a man and his dog, with the dog at his feet. I mean, as if you can still sit in a chair as a skeleton. And also... It'd crumble. If a man and his dog were locked in a room till they both starved to death, I'm sorry, but that dog is going to have had a go <laughs> at that man. The dog is probably going to last it longer and mm. will have definitely had a nibble. But yeah. maybe that's what I mean by at his feet. Like yeah. Gnawing away. As if you were near a dog barking, even if it is in a secret room. Mm. I mean, come on, guys. Um, and also, I mean, he was on the run, but the dog wasn't on the run. No. And why did the dog need to be? Nobody nobody was saying, oh, there's that treacherous dog who well, conspired could, against the king. What is the logistics of this? Is this the man that died, the only man that knew they were in there, who brought the food in, is he taking the dog for walks? <laughs> <laughs> is he coming in? And and if so, people are spotting that and going, oh, yeah, there's old Francis Lovell's dog. He's a good boy. Where's where's he when he's not going for walks? Nowhere. Just... <laughs> no, we, we haven't got a dog. Or... Don't look behind that large portrait of a man and a dog where both of the eyes are moving. <laughs> and the tail's wagging. <laughs> um, the, or... You want to get locked in a secret room with a dog. Dog's going to go to the toilet. Mm. They didn't have little plucky bags in those days. We've established this. It's going to be a lot more of a of a, of a chewy in a pooey room mm, than it's the gonna story. Smell. It's not going to be pleasant at all. But there was definitely dust. So there you was can't definitely dust. take points away. Yeah, what, you, what you've done is you've undermined your own story. But uh, frustratingly, I've already given you five points. So I'm, I'm a man of my word and I can't take any of them back. Well, none of my points were... For credibility. <laughs> yeah, or contingent on it not being a very smelly room. We're, we're silly to give this away for free to, the to you know, you know big dust. <laughs> we've, we've given them, like, their Christmas campaign right there. Except no substitute. I mean, they'll probably get someone better to do the voiceover, somebody who could say most of the words. Um, when you need to cover all your things and sound too gritty, it must be dust. This next tale will leave you shivering every time you hear a rustle of silk. Or possibly not. I have a story about a ghost called Silky. Oh. Mm. Which is another Northumbrian ghost. It's from a quiet village called Black Hedden, which is where hedonism comes from. Really? Nope. Oh. Made it up. Damn. So I just made it up to see your face when you said, Really? <laughs> No. <laughs> Imagine if it was a small village in Northumberland where hedonism was piloted. Or it would be like black hedonism, which would be like the anti-hedonism. That's just, that is what it's like in Northumberland, though. Uh, so it's a small village near Stanford M. And Silky is the name of uh, a female ghost or spectre or bogey 
who for years and years and years, and at the end of the 18th century, haunted and terrified the, the people uh, in that area. This story comes from M.A. Richardson's table book. I'm going I'm to say in advance, before I start reading this, this guy likes long sentences. <laughs> there are some very long sentences, some so long that I've not been able to pay attention to what they're about from start to end, so I'm going to enlist your help in working out what the author's meaning is. Okay, I'll take I've got pen. Yeah, the important thing is that the, the ghost was called Silky, um, a name which presumably does not derive from the Andre Williams album Silky, famously the most sleazy album in the world. I don't think it's that at all. It came from, and now I'm quoting... It's manifesting a marked predilection to make itself visible in the semblance of a female dressed in silk. Many a time, when any of the more timorous of the community had a night journey to perform, have they unawares and invisibly been dogged... Hold on, invisibly? Yeah, come on. All right, been dogged and watched by this spectral tormentor, who, at the dreariest part of the road, the most suitable for a thrilling surprise, would suddenly break forth in dazzling splendour. Presumably not invisible at that point. So they're invisibly following, and invisible, then when they get to the worst bit of the road... Break forth in... Da- I'm imagining a kind of share like image yeah. in the road, which is dazzling. I'm imagining lit-up steps that Silky's <laughs> walking down, <laughs> yeah. and they're lighting up as she's coming down the steps. If the person happened to be on horseback, a sort of exercise for which she evinced a strong partiality, she would unexpectedly seat herself behind, rattling her silks, in inverted commas, which I assume is not meant to be... Sounding, I mean, that's not adding a euphemism. I think it's just a direct quote. I don't know how you rattle a silk. No, that's, I thought the whole point of silk is that it's very quiet. It's yeah. very, I suppose in the wind, like a, I'm flapping my hand. Like, like, like a flapping thing. Li- yeah, like a sail or flag mm. or something yeah, like it that. Yeah, could just, still silk, the very nature of it is that it's quiet. There, after enjoying a comfortable ride, with instantaneous abruptness, she would, like a thing destitute of continuity, dissolve away and become incorporated with the nocturnal shades leaving the bewildered horseman in blank amazement. He should know about continuity. Bloody hell, that sent... How many clauses are in that? When did, when did that sentence start? I'll, 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 You've you two sentences so that, far, right? I, I, pretty much two I'll give you what I think is the longest sentence, not just in the book, but in general, Yet. the longest sentence I've come across. So this is about one of the other things she would do. So that's what she would do. She would ride along and she would appear on the horse behind you, being all rustly, and sometimes appear in front of you looking dazzling by all accounts. One of the other things she would do, as far as I can tell, is be noisy in a forest, um, which is what my understanding of this sentence is. All right, I'll give you the, the shorter sentence before. Here often has the belated peasant with awe-stricken vision beheld her dimly through the sombre twilight as if engaged in splitting great stones or hewing with many a repeated stroke some stately monarch of the grove. New sentence. And while he thus stood and gazed, and listened to intimations impossible to be misapprehended of the dread reality of that mysterious being concerning whom so various conjectures were awake, all at once excited by that wondrous agency, he would have heard the howling of a resistless tempest rushing through the woodland, the branches creaking in violent concussion, or rent into fragments by the impetuous fury of the blast, while to the eye not a leaf was to be seen to quiver, nor a pensile spray to bend. One sentence. Whoa. (laughs) Noisy in a forest. Yeah. Is all I can tell that... But you can't see. You can't see anything. You can just hear... sounds like... ...general noisiness in a forest. That's quite scary. My favourite thing is that um, she she had a sort of a hangout, um, which was a particular area near a pond where there was a tree, um, so uh, over which uh, a venerable tree sweeping its umbrageous arms adds impressiveness to the scene. Now, umbrage is like annoyance, so I I guess umbrageous arms are like the tree going... Come on! <laughs> Silky! I don't know what an annoyed tree would... Like just shaking angrily in the wind like an old man's fist. <laughs> yeah. Amid the complicated contorting limbs of this tree, Silky possessed a rude chair where she was wont in her moody moments to sit. Now, we don't know how rude... <laughs> we don't know in what way the chair was rude. It doesn't <laughs> say. Um, she would stop horses dead in their tracks around Silky Brig, which is Silky Bridge, or so it became named at least after she stopped a horse dead in her tracks. And the only way to dispel her was to have some witch wood about your person, and right. that would uh, that would get the horse moving again. The other thing she did, which was um, not not traditional for ghosts, is that she would mess up your house. So if you tidied everything up on a Saturday night before Sunday morning, well, you'd come up in the, mor- in the morning and she would have messed everything up. Mm. However... If you left everything in a mess, she would tidy it up, which is not bad. It's just kind of nice. Oh, that's okay. But the writer of this is convinced that, that, that she never did anything nice. Uh, oh. And so he probably thinks that she's probably rewarding people who don't deserve it. So if you're lazy and you, you don't tidy up, 
you get you get tidied up, which is more immoral. Yeah, but if it's your house, but you just chuck everything everywhere. You're gonna if she's gonna come by and do it again. Exactly. I think the whole village gave up out. tidying up. They just stopped tidying up eventually. I think so that she would do it. Makes yeah. it much easier. Unless you put stuff away in weird places. I do get annoyed when other people tidy up because I never know. I never yeah. know anything is. But here's the thing that makes Silky remarkable, and it's the end of Silky's story. Silky got ghost busted. Oh. No more Silky, right? Hmm. So most ghosts sort of just peter out. Silky didn't. Silky stopped dead because, well, the, the, the rumour about Silky had always been that, it, <clears throat> quote, it had long been surmised that she was the troubled phantom of some person who had died very miserable in consequence of having great treasure, which before overtaken by her mortal agony had not been disclosed, and on account she could not lie still in her grave. And then what happened was uh, there was a, a domestic female servant in one of the houses in Blackheaden who was just uh, cleaning up alone in one of the rooms, and the ceiling came in, and a black figure fell down from inside the ceiling and landed in the room. And the woman was terrified and ran out of the room shouting, The devil's in the house! The devil's in the house! That was bad news. And so <laughs> it was like, oh, and so she's saying, oh, he's coming through the ceiling, she's, according to this. And there's a really good long sentence here, if I might, if I might trouble you with a long sentence. Go on. With this terrible announcement, the whole family were speedily convoked, and great was the consternation at the idea of the foe of mankind being amongst them in a visible form. In this appalling extremity, a considerable time elapsed before anyone could brace up courage to face the enemy, or be prevailed on to go and inspect the cause of their alarm. At last the mistress, who happened to be the most stout-hearted, ventured into the room, when instead of the personage on account of whom such awful apprehensions were entertained, a great dog or calf skin lay on the floor, sufficiently black and uncomely, but... Filled with gold. That's how you end a ghost story. A dead dog full of money falls on someone's head. <laughs> um, her, uh, after that, Silky was never heard or seen of again. Um, her destiny was accomplished, her spirit laid, and she now sleeps with her ancestors as peacefully and unperturbed as do the degenerate and unenterprising ghosts of modern days. <laughs> a, an unnecessary dig at mod modern ghosts. These modern ghosts. Bloody modern ghosts. Bloody nuisances. Uh, but, so that that was it. That's the story of Silky slash ceiling dog <laughs> money bag. <laughs> ah, I mean, for a three sentence story, <laughs> that guy sure packed a lot in. And okay, questions. What was the second sentence? <laughs> so what we've got here is a lady ghost who. Is frightening mostly men? Mostly men, mostly on horseback, mostly yes. Mostly horsebacked men by making a noise. Yeah, it's mostly the rustling of silk. Right. If that's her thing, she should have worn noisier clothes like a shell suit or something. <laughs> I mean, there's a glare. I mean, I've got a big problem with the maid at the end who's tidying up. When we already know that if you don't tidy up, silk is going to do it for you. That's She may have been causing a mess. Inst oh, so, it, doesn't, that, it doesn't say whether she was tidying or, or making a mess ready for it to be tidied. What's the level? I imagine the nurse was probably just there putting down a few saucers with the biscuit crumbs on them. Just to make sure that Silky came to tidy up, make the beds. Tipped over the threshold into yeah. mess. But we don't know who she is, just that she had some... Got, she, she Gold went missing. We... Uh, you've got me on the ropes here. Oh. We don't know anything about her, or indeed... The, whether she had any gold. It's just that some people had a sense that she was missing. I mean, the fact, the idea that she had been missing her gold was obviously put in afterwards, after the dog full of gold fell out of the ceiling. And that fell down and then Silky stopped and showing but, up. But so Silky like, stopped. Well, there were no obviously. reports of Silky after that, except occasionally on people's deathbeds. So from then on, she only ever appeared as a deathbed spirit. And did she show up as, as fabulous? Or did she sort of match, match her uh, mode of entrance to I, the situation? I would hope so, because you don't want to come in like Liberace if someone's on their deathbed. Mm. You don't want to just fly down on a golden swan. Or dog, riding or, on a golden dog. <laughs> riding on calf. a golden dog, all gold coins falling out of its seams. Do you not think that might have just been a sack? A sack, yes, but a sack made from a dog. A dog sack. Because the, for me, it implies a backstory where someone had got a lot of gold. Oh, we've managed to hide all this gold from the Doomsday Book or something. Where are we going to keep it, Dad? Dad, why are you looking at Rover? <laughs> Naturally, we're going to put it in the... In, and we don't also know whether the dog was dead before the money went in or just as a consequence of being filled with gold. So that's, the, the very idea of it is, is, is grotesque. 
Because, you know, when someone's got a very old dog and they don't move very much, they just sort of sit there yeah. smelling slightly. Maybe their dog had got to that stage and they were like, and they realised they needed somewhere to hide their gold. And it just... So they just filled the dog up there. So whenever anyone came round, it was still that yeah, stinky dog. Yeah, just pop your feet up on it. And yeah. nobody, nobody noticed. Oh, a dog full of gold. It is. I mean, it is literally the last place you would look. Inside an animal. Inside an animal in the loft as well. They ended up putting it in, like... Oh, yeah, or within the ceiling. Heaved it right up as well. If you had got to the stage where you were looking in the crawl space of a building, if you found the dead body of a dog there, you're not even going to prod it and hear it sort of jingle a little bit and think... a horrible leathery piggy bank. Maybe it's not the brilliant disguise I assumed. I think... If you hide it in plain sight, like you have it as though it's like, oh, that's, and that's our mummified dog, even. You can even go that. Yeah, weird. or just have it looking out the window all the time. That makes it look suspicious. You're absolutely right, yeah. They made a terrible error. And, that, and that's why it was found out. And that's why they, they cut it up and presumably found all the gold. Well, the, the, it just fell down in the end. It just, time took its toll on putting a load of metal. In what presumably was like wooden. Oh, in those days, ceilings were made of just cheese and uh, Paper, straw. A drawing of a ceiling. <laughs> okay, let's get back, let's get back to Silky herself. Doing a good service. She's bright now. S- Silky sounds the road. great, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's a bit. It's got a sort of um, uh, a drag queeny kind of feel to it. Yeah, show she's putting on, and I I appreciate that, especially with the the, the angry trees and the rude chair. Well, do you think if she is kind of going for the drag queen vibe, that's probably quite a rude chair. I have to say, but just I think at this point, people will wonder if we know the actual meaning of the word rude in that context. I don't. Okay. Uh, it just means simple, sim- unsophisticatedly oh, made. the opposite. Uh, in the sense of, um, like, the rude mechanicals in Midsummer Night's Dream. Like, rudimentary, that's it. Okay. So not actually, necessarily, offensive chair. <laughs> got, like, <laughs> fingers, up, like, on the bits where you put your arms, it's just got middle fingers up. Yeah. And it says on the back, it's now... Yeah, like those t-shirts. <laughs> they seem all right on the front. Right, I'm. A, I, I. To, to be honest, some of those sentences, all of them, even the one that you said was the short one, were a little bit long. This was the Victorian era, so this was before the invention of entertainment of any kind, and so really long sentences were a good way of passing the time before right. death. <laughs> what What was the thing about dreary corners and pizzazz? Um, pizzazz. I'm guessing is my own word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, search for the word pizzazz. She would appear uh, on corners, the dreariest being the best for her. Yeah, what's happened there is he's in, he's just inserted his opinion about right. where, what areas of the road are most suitable for a thrilling surprise. And then, kablam! A fantastical... Silky's here. Yeah, <laughs> you did say that in a silky... Silky's it here. Will be and then the glitter falls from the ceiling and... and big letters, like Elvis... <laughs> Right, mm, I imagine she starts facing away from you and then spins around and then spotlights. Yeah, and then the steps, down the steps, all like light, light. I mean, this is the peop- the poor people of Black Heddon in Northumberland. It's a dreary existence they live. This is has got to be the visual highlight of the year. This M.A. Richardson, I think, has got the wrong end of this silky stick here because she seems to be doing all good. She's brightening up dreary points of the road. She's acting as a companion for lonely riders. The experience of seeing silk. I don't get what she was doing in the tree in the chair, to be honest. And But she's um, tidying just, up houses. Just and, rocking, I think. She was just rocking the wind. She's trying to calm down a grumpy tree. <laughs> and she's filling their pets with gold. She sounds great. All good, Silky. Keep doing it. Why did you stop? No, I like her. He's got the wrong idea of her. So, scores. Uh, can I give you some categories? And yes. you want to give me some scores? All right. Well, the first category, naturally, is supernatural. That's going to be five of five. Good. I mean, there is no scientific explanation for any of the stuff that I've described. No. No. Not at all. Loud noises in a forest. Pff, you're joking. Ghosts. Yeah. Seeing someone in a tree. Ghost. Uh, <laughs> it's obvious. Yeah. Forgetting whether you've tidied your house or not. Ghosts. Dreary bits of the road. Ghosts. Yeah. Horses. Ghosts. Go. It's ghosts, ghosts, ghosts. Yes. So I accept your I accept your five out of five as, as no more than Silky's due. Mm. Um, this is a, maybe a trickier one. What about the, the traditional category of names? That's a good... Silky 
is the only name we've got. It's a good name. It seems to describe actually. Whoa. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally oh, as I, I'm saying. I could feel that four or five stars coming my way and now receding. There's one name, and it, I think it's inaccurate. And it does. It doesn't silky. And the only thing that defines her silkiness is the noise that it makes. That could be any fabric, and most other fabrics are likely to be noisier. Tim foil. I think you're right. I was going to try and argue, but I think you're... Sorry, Silky. So what's your, what's your score there? It has got a... That's got a little something about it. I'm not going to forget it. I think so, Silky, Silky has a bit of... It's got a bit of show business and a bit of razzmatazz. And exactly. if nothing else, that is what Silky bought, brought. So, yeah, Silky, the sole name, she puts herself up there with Madonna, Seal, or the other mob with one name. All right, so what's your, what's your final score for names? It's going to be... I think two would be under underrating the branding... Of Silky. Yeah. But three seems a bit much for someone that's only got one name that is inaccurate. If they'd have had something for the for the um, dog full of gold that they thought was the devil, if that had maybe got a little name in there, like... Oh, did I mention his name is um, Arthur Johnson? Jeff. <laughs> uh, I didn't know his name. No, two. It's going to be two. It's a two. Ah, sorry, Silky. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, Silky. Um, my next category is... Rude Chairs is the next category. Rude Chairs, five. <laughs> five out of five for Rude Chairs. And mm. The full title for this category is Rude Chair slash Grumpy Tree. Brilliant, yeah. That's a, a not, full five That's there. not subtracting any points. Well, that more than makes up for, yep. for, the, for the names problem. And, Tree emotions. <laughs> and my final category, Silk Purse Out of a Sow's Ear. Well, five, Silky. Five? Because it's Silky's purse yes. out of a dead dog's carcass. <laughs> Well, that is a that is a wonderfully high score. Unsurprisingly, they cleaned the phrase up. Would you hold it by the legs? Do you think you could oh. try? You could trust the legs together and put it over your arm like a handbag. Yeah, yeah, like a, a abhorrent handbag. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, it just shows you know once people found out there was gold in there, they'd start treating you differently. Yeah, if you're because you, you wouldn't be able to walk if you had a dog's worth of gold <laughs> on there. <laughs> a dog's worth of gold. Dogs, yeah. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, because yeah, it's a silk purse out of a sow's ear in a sense, because um, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, jumbly rubbish here. But the general charisma of Sitki has tied the whole thing together into a flamboyant, entertaining display that ends with a dog full of money falling on someone. <laughs> I didn't see that come in. To be honest, when you said, "Don't worry, the silky story does come to a resolution." I don't think I even thought a dog would be involved at all. No. Let alone one full of gold. Let alone it falling out of the roof. Let alone someone thinking that was the devil for no particular reason. And that is just bang, 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 bang. Even a cat full of gold would be a lot. <laughs> You have been listening to Lawmen. The Lawmen are Alistair Beckett King and James Shakeshaft. If you enjoyed Lawmen, please rate and subscribe in all the usual places. And if you didn't enjoy Lawmen, we'll lock ourselves in a room. Lawmen.